Greetings fellow gorehounds and welcome back to another blood splattered vlog. Alrighty then, so I've finally returned from Monster Palooza and Walker Stalker Con, so I guess it's time to get back to making videos. And I figure why not start with something very simple and not too complicated. So this week's movie is none other than The Windmill, a Dutch horror film that I recall making fun of in my Scream magazine unboxings. And I believe in that magazine it was actually called The Windmill Massacre as opposed to its American title The Windmill because in the UK it was called The Windmill Massacre and Scream magazine was a UK magazine so there you go. And I remember sitting there looking at the title, making fun of it, going like, what, is the windmill gonna go on a massacre all of itself? Because I would totally watch that. I know this movie is gonna involve someone killing somebody by windmills, but if this is not a movie about a killer windmill, then fuck this movie. <laughs> Just fuck it. I am, I am not having a movie called The Windmill Massacre unless a windmill actually massacres someone. But no, what the Windmill Massacre is, and what the Windmill is, because it's the same movie, just a different title, is it's a slasher movie set in the Netherlands. Or Holland, if you prefer to call it that. And one thing the Netherlands has, outside of Amsterdam, weed, and prostitution, is it has a lot of windmills. And this movie centers around a bunch of foreigners in a tour guide group who are going around checking out all the historic windmills. And unfortunately, their tour guide bus breaks down in the middle of a fucking forest, and they stumble across a windmill that really shouldn't be there. Usually when you see windmills, they're in the middle of an open field because that's where the wind blows. But for some reason, like I said, this windmill is in the middle of a dense, tightly packed forest. And then all of a sudden, they start getting picked off one by one by a slasher killer who may or may not be tied into a local legend of that windmill. And that is where I'm going to stop talking about the plot, because anything beyond that is pretty much a spoiler. And so yeah, I guess it's time for me to talk about how I felt about this movie. I actually really liked it. It's surprisingly a really well shot horror movie. It's not particularly scary, but it is very well acted and well written up to a point. You see, I actually have one big problem with this movie that stops it from being truly great that I'll talk about when I get to the spoilers. But needless to say, it happens at the very end of the movie, and I kind of wish the movie had stopped before it happened. But yeah, if you like yourself some European slasher movies like Cold Prey, then I highly recommend The Windmill. Plus, it's got some really good practical gore effects, and I'll always praise a movie for having that. And another thing I really like about the movie is that even though all the characters are heavily flawed, I did end up liking them as the movie went on. There's one or two of them that are completely awful people, and you will love to hate them. But even still, they're fully well-rounded characters, and I liked that everyone in this movie didn't feel like a cardboard cutout. Everyone has their own background, their own motivations, and their own reasons to be on this tour bus. But more than that, everyone has a reason to react the way they do to the circumstance that happens in the movie. And very few of them did I feel like it was a gross overreaction, because it is a really fucked up situation, and I totally understood their point of view. And sometimes that's all you can ask for. Even if a character is going to be categorically awful and you're going to hate them, if you can at least understand their point of view, then it elevates them from being just a simple character into being a real person. I'm not sure if any of that's making sense, I feel like I'm being a little rambly, but hopefully you understand what I'm saying. Anyway, my fellow gorehounds, this movie is currently available on Netflix in North America. I can't speak for other countries, but if for whatever reason it's not available on Netflix, I'm pretty sure you can find it on Amazon or iTunes or any of those other platforms. Once again, I'm not endorsed by any of these companies, I just like what they got. And with all that said, my fellow gorehounds, let us move on to the spoilers. So the first 20 minutes of this movie is all over the place because we're being introduced to all of these characters before they get onto the bus that brings them together. The first character we're introduced to is this Australian girl who's obviously working as some sort of housekeeper for this Dutch family, but the father of the household comes in and is like, I need to talk to you, and then they go off into another room where he reveals that he finds out that she's been lying about who she is. She gave him one name, but on her passport is a completely different name, so who is she? And more importantly, why is she lying and can I trust her around my kids? So he calls the police, she smashes a vase over his head, and then runs away, and then from that point on is on the run from the cops. The next two characters we're introduced to is this man and his son that are on vacation in the Netherlands. Off the top of my head, I can't remember which country they were from, but I'm pretty sure it was the UK. Anyway, the son is really excited to be in the Netherlands, but his dad is constantly on these business phone calls. So you kind of have that like 90s trope of the father who's working all the time and the son who wants his father's attention but is not getting it. But as we'll find out as the movie goes on, it's a little more complicated than that. 
And the next character we're introduced to is a war vet who's basically on leave with his unit. And because they're a bunch of guys on leave, they decide to go to Amsterdam and get laid. So one of his friends pays a prostitute to sleep with him, but when they get into the back room, he has a complete PTSD flashback and freaks out and runs away. Or at least we think he runs away because they don't actually show us what happens after he freaks out. We do not know what transpired between the freak out and the running out. Which will become important later, as I will explain in a minute. And the next character we're introduced to is a doctor who's learning to paint by going to a museum and basically copying one of the paintings himself. Basically one of those exercises of, if you can replicate this, then you can at least understand how the artist did it. And then you can take those tools and use it for yourself to create your own work. But he ends up staring at this one painting and completely losing his track of time, and then freaking out and running into the back room, and then snorting some coke. And the thing about the painting he was looking at is that it was obviously some sort of surgery on someone's brain. And since we learn that he's a doctor, you start to wonder, oh man, what is it about this surgery that seems to be triggering for him? And that will also become important later on, if you can see the pattern that's developing here. And another character we're introduced to is a French photographer who goes to this magazine to get a job, but the guy's like, we really don't have any openings. And she's like, yeah, but I really need a job. Is there any way I can do anything to get some sort of work from you? So the guy's like, well, we do need photographs of windmills for this one catalog. So off she goes to join the tour with everyone else. All these characters collide on this one tour bus to go on a tour around Holland to see all the windmills. But the Australian girl, which is basically our main character, she doesn't have a ticket to get onto the bus, but she knows that she needs to get on the bus so she can get the fuck away from the police. And the tour guide ends up taking pity on her, saying, you know what, there's more than enough room for more sinners on this bus. And I'd like to point out the way he worded that, sinners on this bus. Trust me, that will become important. So while these characters are on the bus, we learn a lot more about them. Namely, we learn a lot about the Australian girl, who it turns out is on the run from something she did to her father. Who we learn from her PTSD flashbacks was an abusive fuck. And as a result of this, she may or may not be experiencing hallucinations. In fact, the reason their bus ends up breaking down is because she sees her father walk into the road and she freaks out and the bus comes to a screeching halt. And for some reason, they can't get the bus to start up again after that. She decides like, hey, there's a windmill all the way over there in the forest. Why don't we go over there and call for help? And since it's my fault that this all happened, I'll go do that myself so you guys can all stay here on the bus. But the war vet guy is like, you know what, you probably shouldn't go out there in the woods all alone, so I'll go with you. So the two PTSD kids walk into the forest, and then the war vet is fucking slaughtered by this fucking slasher killer. But right before he was slaughtered, we learned that he actually ended up killing the hooker in the room before he ran out. So the reason why he's on the tour bus is because, well, he needs to get away too because he's now a murderer. And once we learn about this, he's killed almost as if in punishment for what he did by this slasher killer. Who's basically this really big, like, Freddy Krueger style burnt up face dude with this giant scythe. And he just fucking brutalizes him. He slices him in fucking half. It's fucking gnarly. The Australian girl freaks out, runs back to the bus, but everyone on the bus assumes that she's crazy and hallucinating. So the father of the son decides to take charge and is like, we're going to go to that windmill ourselves and we're going to get help. So they go to the windmill and once at the windmill, they learn that apparently this windmill might be the windmill from this one legend. Basically, there was this one miller who decided that he was going to sell his soul to the devil in order to keep his windmill turning, even when there wasn't wind to turn it. Hence why this windmill is in the middle of a dense forest and is still spinning despite there being no wind. And while this is all happening, another character, which I completely forgot to mention earlier, essentially this Japanese dude who's basically come to Holland to visit his grandmother's grave and pray at her grave because apparently at some point in his life he couldn't handle how sick she was and ran away. And as a result, she died an extremely painful death alone without her grandson to take care of her. And he ends up wandering into the forest because he sees his grandmother's dog, like, leading him on deeper into the forest. And he ends up stumbling across his grandmother's wheelchair and ends up breaking down crying and asking for forgiveness for what he did. And the next thing we see the slasher killer coming up behind him and getting ready to slice him, and then it cuts away. But then later, the Japanese guy comes back and is like, hey, we can survive this. This guy will actually let you go if you repent for your sins. Essentially, every character here, with the exception of the little boy, did something extremely wrong. The doctor got coked up and drunk and ended up killing a girl on the operating table when he was supposed to be saving her. The French chick used to be a model in Japan, which is why this Japanese character actually recognizes her when they first meet. But she had a rival model in Japan who kept getting work over her, so she paid a Yakuza member to cut her face up. And as a result, her rival ended up killing herself when her face was malformed. And the father and son, it turns out the father actually killed the son's mother before they went on this trip, and that's why they went on this impromptu vacation. 
And the Australian girl, it turns out, is there not necessarily for killing her father, but because in the process of burning her father alive, she ended up accidentally killing her brother. And not only has she never forgiven herself for this, this is also why she's here, why she's in this mill that's essentially a gateway to hell. But as the Japanese guy proved, there's one way out. If you confess to your sin, if you apologize, if you actually repent, then you can be let free. But in a surprising twist, the tour guide is actually in on the whole thing, and he is actually there to essentially clean up and kill the people that repent. So he's essentially a sinner working for the devil Miller in order to make sure that no one ever makes it out alive, regardless of whether they repent. So now the stakes are super high, and characters are getting murdered left and right, and oh my god, this is such slashery goodness. You're watching the asshole characters get their comeuppance, you're watching the good characters get fates that they probably don't necessarily deserve, and your heart is wrenching with them when it happens, and it's all building up to this great climax where at the end of the movie the girl has to essentially save the little boy from the windmill which is now on fire, echoing her past where she had to save her brother but she was too scared of the fire to run in and save him, and this is the point where I absolutely have to spoil the absolute end of the movie in order to talk about the thing I don't like about this movie. So if you don't want the absolute ending spoiled, I suggest you stop now, because right now, this is the point of no return. And with that said, what I really don't like about the absolute end of this movie is that she successfully succeeds in saving the kid, but then the Miller shows up and kills her anyway, and I'm like, what the fuck? Normally, I'm okay with nihilistically brutal endings, but in this case, I feel like the movie had to betray its core tenet in order to have this ending. Up until that point, if the characters repent for themselves, then they're allowed to be let free. But in this case, no, she's not allowed to be let free. But why? She repented. Now, the only thing that would make this make sense to me is if maybe it's because she doesn't actually confess or feel bad about killing her father. But why the hell would hell itself care about that? The father was obviously an evil man. If anything, she did hell a favor because she sent that guy straight to fucking hell. So I don't know, maybe it's because she didn't openly, like, verbally confess or apologize for what she did, but I really feel like saving the kid speaks way louder than words. I mean, at least if they had the other guy kill her instead of the Miller, then it would at least follow the logic of, well, he's supposed to kill the people who repent too. I just don't know, man. Like, it felt like the movie was just 100%, it was a 10 out of 10 slasher, and then in the last second, it turned into a 7 out of 10. If you want to watch this movie yourself, it is currently available in America on Netflix, and maybe some other countries, but I'm not sure, but if not, not check Amazon or iTunes or whatever your local thing is. And as per usual, my fellow gorehounds, be sure to like, comment, subscribe, and be sure to ring that notification bell so that you're notified of my videos immediately upon their upload. And as I always say, peace out, and I'll catch y'all later.